and welcome to another edition of the Media Twits. I'm Mark Glazer, executive editor of PBS Media Shift. Today we'll be talking about HBO and CBS starting new streaming services that do not require a subscription to cable or satellite. What does this mean for cord cutters and will this threaten the cable bundling or is this just another way that TV is insinuating itself onto digital platforms? Um, before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, uh, Next Space and Next Kids. Running your own business requires focus, and so does parenting. Media Twits podcast sponsor, Next Space, created a place where parents could give their best quality of attention to both co working space and childcare space under one roof. Learn more at nextspace.us/slash next kids. And I am indeed in the next space space, and my uh, one-year-old son is next door in childcare. So it's a great, a great place to be. Um, before we get started on our discussion, I want to introduce our panel today. We've got Alex Leo at Newsweek, Andrew Lee at American University, David Lieberman from Deadline.com, Fanny Cohen, our producer in New York, Peter Kafka at Recode. So HBO, in a kind of a surprise, we kind of knew it was coming, we didn't know when, but HBO announced that it would start a streaming service. We don't know a lot of details about it, we don't know the price yet, um, but it will be something you can get without having a cable subscription um, for the first time. And um, a lot of people actually have been demanding HBO um, to run such a service. There was a site called Take My Money HBO, and People actually were polled and said they would pay an average of $12 a month for such a service. And now CBS is also offering a pay service $6 a month, which actually goes into effect immediately in the 14 markets where it owns its stations. Um, and CBS will, will not be including live sports like football from Sunday and Thursday, um, which is a little bit more of a niche service. So first let's talk about HBO and what they're doing. That seems to be kind of the bigger move and a little bit of an attack on Netflix and Hulu and other streaming services. Um, Peter, how do you kind of put this move in the perspective of, of the industry, of the TV and streaming industry? Is this a big watershed moment, or is it just an incremental move? Symbolically, it's a big deal. Uh, right? We won't know the real effects for a while. We need to see what the actual product is. We've got a pretty good sense of what it's going to be. It's going to be priced about 15 bucks a month or more. It's going to be sold, hopefully, uh, HBO things will be sold with the existing cable companies like like Comcast. They'll probably find someone like uh, Amazon to help them bundle it on the web as well. They might sell it directly. And it'll have everything that's on HBO Go right now. So we've got a pretty good sense of what it'll look like. Um, and what HBO is telling the world is this, is this is a big deal, but it's also not a big deal. right? On the one hand, they don't want to destroy their existing business, which generates $5 billion a year. And they're saying this is just going to be sort of on the margins. This is just targeting a few million millennials who haven't signed up for cable TV. So don't worry about this. This isn't going to screw up our core business. And what we don't know is whether that's actually the case, whether this actually is the beginning of the thing that starts sort of unbundling all of TV. Anyone who tells you they know is, is bullshitting, but, but, uh, but it's pretty interesting. It is indeed. Um, and do you think of CBS's move as being maybe a smaller move just because you can get CBS over the air? I mean, how do you kind of compare the two? Yeah, because they two came back to back, um, it sort of heightened the import on its own. This would be more seen more as a novelty. Uh, Les Moonves doesn't want everyone to watch CBS this way. He wants the most. He wants 100 million people to pay two dollars a month uh, through their cable through their cable provider to watch CBS, not a couple million people to pay $6 a month. So this is, and the way that CBS signals as they say, this is for super fans, right? Uh, people who really want to watch every episode of Big Brother, etc. Uh, you can say that's a niche service. It's still pretty interesting, though, what they're doing. I think it's interesting, on top of that, that there was always a way to watch a CBS show in uh, on Amazon in real time. Um, or on iTunes, but that's not true for HBO. Until this year, they had when they made a deal with Amazon to show their old series online, you couldn't buy bespoke episodes of shows in real time anywhere on the web. So that kind of push for people to, for HBO to go online from millennials was so heightened because there was no other option to pay 
and just watch Silicon Valley or just watch one of their series. So for me, this HBO thing cuts both ways. It's great because um, you don't have to own a TV or subscribe to a cable service, which I don't want to do in my life. But it also means I have to stop sharing my HBO Go Pass from family. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the funny thing is that this is also a move in a way to, you know, it's, it's similar to what was going on in music sharing where there's all these peer-to-peer -peer services and then Apple came in and offered iTunes and 99 cent songs so that people would kind of stop stealing music in a way and, and, and to a certain extent it did work. Um, David, what do you see as kind of the potential here? Was, uh, you know, you kind of downplayed, there was a lot of talk about this, you know, really completely changing the way that, you know, cable bundles worked and a la carte is here to stay and this is just going to be the best ever and you really knocked that down. Why, why were you throwing cold water on all of our celebrations? <laughs> I think the last thing that Time Warner wants is for anyone to cut the cord. Because in addition to HBO, which isn't a nice profit center for them, they also have their Turner Networks. And that's an even bigger profit center for them. And last week they went in front of Wall Street and they said, look, all the way through 2018, the profits here are going to grow at double digit rates per year. Uh, the biggest source of that is going to be the fees that they get from cable and satellite companies. So. You know, sure, maybe uh, HBO can find a way to uh, uh, help itself by uh, helping people cut the cord, but it would be terrible for Turner. And now you've been up since, what, 3 in the morning for this Comcast live blog for their earnings, and they kind of came out and said, oh, you know, this is really interesting what's going on with HBO and CBS. Um, but they didn't seem to be very worried about it at all. Yeah, well, I'm in New York, so it wasn't that bad. Okay. Uh, well, uh, yeah, no, uh, that's Comcast for you too, which is that it's it's a hedge. It's not they're not trying to destroy the ecosystem. Uh, and Time Warner is pretty clear about this last week as well. Uh, they're, they're targeting the 10 million people who get broadband but not pay TV. And you know, likely what we're going to see is uh, something like what they're doing with Comcast now, which is you buy the uh, cable from uh, you buy the broadband from Comcast, you get some level of a uh, broadcast channels, then you can get HBO. Yeah, now, now Alex, we know you're ready to sign up for HBO on its own streaming service. Andrew, what do you, how do you feel about, I mean, how many people do you think they have the potential to get, especially if they are going to charge $15 plus, like, like Peter is saying, I mean, would you get it at, you know, what rate would you want to get it at, and how do you, what do you think the tipping point is where they really will bring in a lot of people? Well, I think as David pointed out, I mean, because the MSOs are not freaking out, this is probably not as big as a move as a lot of the tech outlets seem to think it is, right? So um, we're only seeing maybe 10% of the picture right now. There really are no details yet on what HBO is going to do. Like, can you subscribe a la carte to HBO if you are not a broadband subscriber to Comcast or Time Warner or to Verizon? Maybe not. We don't know yet. So it might be tied to you still must be a corded, broadband subscriber, you just can't buy HBO a la carte. And then there's also the question of, so let's say you do pay, and most people are thinking around 15 bucks a month for this so-called a la carte HBO, can you watch the shows um, as they air? Right? Can you watch Boardwalk Empire the exact same time it's airing on the cable chain? Maybe not. Maybe they'll say next day. Um, or is it going to be as good or not as good as HBO Go? There's a lot of unknowns there. Um, and I think the, the CBS offering is particularly uh, disappointing because you don't get the sports content, right? So it's kind of like CBS minus some significant things that most people would expect on CBS. So it might appeal to the real diehard fans of NCIS and The Good Wife who, you know, say, hey, you know, it's worth six bucks a month for the shows I really like and I'm traveling anywhere and I can watch it from anywhere. But it really doesn't seem to be the revolutionary thing that has finally exploded the bundles so that we can get anything we want a la carte anytime. Peter, you look like you wanted to jump in and, say, and add something. Just, I mean, we should, sorry, we should just be clear. I mean, we, we do know it's, it's going to be, you'll, you'll be able to watch regular HBO, you'll be able to watch Game of Thrones when it airs. That's the point of the product. It's not going to, there was a thought that it might be sort of a crippled product, and that's how HBO might want to thread the needle. But uh, HBO has been quite clear, if not explicit, on, and on the record, that it's going to be the real HBO Go product. You'll be able to watch this stuff. Um, and you will be able to get it from someone other than a, a broadband provider. We don't know who. Um, you can sort of imagine lots of likely suspects. Uh, we don't know whether you'll be able to sign up at HBO directly, but I don't think it really matters to most people. The point is you'll be able to get this stuff. 
um, and it is designed to, to, to be one of the reasons we know that you'll be able to get it without having to get a, a Comcast TV subscription is because that's what one of the things that HBO wants here, right? They want leverage um, to do other deals with, with Comcast. They want to have, they want to be able to go to Comcast and say, look, we are going to sell this product elsewhere, which is one of the reasons you should sell it with us. Um, because if you listen to the call today, there was a lot of sort of signaling from Comcast with their displeasure about this announcement. So there's going to be some sort of negotiations, uh, both public and, and, and private, about how this works. Uh, by the way, the cable guys really are surprised by this. They, they thought, because in part because Time Warner had been saying for several years they wouldn't do this. Um, you can go find lots of quotes from Time Warner and HBO executives explaining why this was not a good idea um, up until really this fall. Um, so they are surprised by it, and so now there's going to be a discussion on sort of how they're going to work with HBO over this. So this, you know, this isn't the end of TV as we know it, but it's certainly a, an important move, and, and it's one that caught the, a lot of the industry by surprise, and I think that's one of the reasons. Um, you know, you're not going to see Comcast saying out loud what they think about this one way or the other, uh, but they're certainly scratching their heads right now. Peter, are there any indications about the pricing or what, what they've decided yet? No, they haven't announced pricing, but but I um, you know you, there was a Wall Street Journal article up within an hour or so of the announcement saying the pricing would be you know at a minimum the same as the cable TV pricing, which makes sense, right? They can't undercut their existing product. Right, and put it put this in context a little bit because Time Warner you know had there was a takeover bid from Fox, and Time Warner has now is not a cable company anymore. It is a pure um, you know content company. So is this, and, and Time Warner is now trying to prove that they can increase revenues and really make it on their own and not have to kind of sidle up with uh, Rupert Murdoch. Is this one of those moves to say, look, we can bring in more revenue, we can be a player on our own? Yes, exactly. So if you're watching the Game of Thrones or True Detective 2 um, and you're getting it through their a la carte service, you can thank Rupert Murdoch for that because he's definitely an impetus for this, for this project. What were you going to say, Alex? You're going to jump yeah, in. You know, I think that one issue here that we haven't covered yet is the demographics behind things. So HBO, there's a huge HBO base that only watches movies on HBO, which I was kind of shocked by as a person that only watches their TV shows. Um, and I can certainly see the millennials that are only watching the TV shows signing up and cutting off that $15 a month service as those TV shows air. So not continuously paying $15 a month year-round. Um, with CBS, it seems like a, a completely different uh, demo issue to me because I don't know anyone who watches NCIS of my generation. I, I, I have no idea if that's accurate, but um, I can't imagine the mothers who love Mark Harmon um, signing up for this service as a bespoke issue to get rid of their CBS watching. I mean, if that if that were part of it, if they really thought that was part of the business model, that would affect their whole ecosystem. Because as you know, the primetime scheduling also affects the morning news scheduling. I mean, they are already in third place with CBS this morning. They can't afford to lose primetime viewers that then wake up with that. So I think CBS is a whole different play than HBO in terms of the demos. But how many of these services can you get? I mean, are you going to get HBO and Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime. I mean, eventually, doesn't that add up to a cable bundle? Absolutely. And I think, for me, I won't pay for Hulu because it has advertising and you pay for it, and I won't do both. It's one or the other. Um, and I don't know what CBS's plans are there. So if Peter does or if Andrew does or David, please jump in. But I'm, I mean, you can't. I mean, eventually, this all costs more than the 40 bucks that Comcast charges. I mean, um, Time Warner Cable charges me for cable. David, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, CBS is going to have advertising. In fact, one of the things they said was that um, it'll be rated. You know, this isn't one of those things online where Nielsen can't find the, the viewers. They will be able to find them. And I think the demographic point is a good one also. The uh, average age of a CBS viewer is something like 57, 58. And this is clearly a service for 18 to 34 year olds. Right, and I guess they won't have ads, I think, for sure aren't on the air anymore. I think their older shows, they aren't going to have ads, but the newer ones they will, but they said 25% less than what they do on the air or something like that. But I, I, it all feels a little bit experimental to me, like there's, they're trying some things out, throwing things on the wall, see what happens. And I mean, that's the one thing we really haven't seen among the broadcasters is a whole lot of experimentation. It feels like they are in search of something and they're not quite sure what it is. I think that's fair. 
you know, but six dollars is a pretty high price to pay for CBS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, to be clear, I mean, again, like th there's a reason that it's priced that high. There's a couple reasons, right? One, they're they're getting two dollars a subscriber on on uh, on cable already, whether you like it or not. If you're paying for cable, you're paying them two bucks a month. And so if they can get anyone to sign up at $6 a month, that helps them position the $2 is a good deal. They're going to ask for 3 eventually. Uh, and again, like, they look at this as ancillary revenue. So, I, you know, one of the things that they were saying, I think they said it publicly, is, you know, they used to sell a Big Brother all-access package online. So people who really liked Big Brother and wanted to watch this thing 24-7 could pay them additional money and watch it. And they're going to fold that into this service. So if you're a hardcore Big Brother fan, and apparently they exist, you'll sign up. Um, if you're someone who really likes The Good Wife and you don't want to pay for it, you don't want to watch it on CBS or you're, you're buying it on iTunes, then maybe the math works out well for you here. Not quite sure. I think it's two bucks of an episode on, on iTunes. So yeah, you're saving, you're saving two dollars a month there. You know, you find a handful of people here and there who sign up for it. Um, the other way they position it is uh, Hulu is eight, is eight bucks a month. That gets you six channels plus but they have, you know, but this, they're going to argue this is comparable or whatever, uh, and it's going to be $6 a month. And so, you, you know, there's, they think there's some pockets of people who, who will sign up for this. They don't think Alex is going to sign up for it. They don't think most of us are going to sign up for it. But, but, you know, again, Hulu's got 6 million subscribers for their package. They think this is comparable. Yeah, and you did a little bit of math on, you know, what if, I think you said a third of Hulu subscribers signed up for this, they could bring in $144 million a year, which isn't, you know, just nothing. No, it's it's you know they they it's it's not huge. It's not enormously significant to their top line, but it's very it'd be a very profitable uh, service for them. They keep all that money enough to share with anybody, so then they'd like to have it. Yeah, and what what do you guys? I'm curious what you all think might happen next. What the next shoe to drop? Is it going to be another network? Um, I mean, would Comcast eventually create its own streaming service? I mean, do you see this just becoming something that? that that everyone will be offering, and we'll just see who wins. Do you have any thoughts, David? Well, a lot depends on the rights. I mean, one thing to keep in mind is the rights to these shows, and particularly sports, they're all locked up. You know, it's not like they can just take the stuff that they've got and say, now we're going to put it online. So uh, I think that's a real problem. In terms of what's next, you know, Showtime is probably next. They're probably all going to have something pretty soon. Um, but the, the real question is, at what price and what are the gates you got to go through to, to get there? Yeah, and I mean, then it becomes really the a la carte model where you're just picking and choosing. I mean, will it get down to just the show level or the producer level where a studio, you know, would just, you know, go straight to the audience um, and ask for something? Or is that going too far? Is that too difficult to pull off? I, I think it's, it's too far. And, and the, the, the problem is just they've got a great system right now. I mean, they can pretty much guarantee that 80% of the country must pay for channels that they don't watch. And uh, you know, that, it doesn't get better than that. So they're not going to do anything that's going to destroy that system. Andrew, yeah, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, I was wondering from, from Peter and David. I mean, it seems like sports programming is kind of like the thousand pound weight that is keeping the system in place, right? That is basically keeping these bundles there. It is definitely against the grain of what a lot of people want in terms of seeing what you want when you want it. I mean, sports programming, at least like college football and everything, is still very much appointment viewing, where you have to kind of watch it when it airs. And as long as the cable channel is kind of a lock on that, they're going to still have a dominant position in, in selling those bundles the way they have now. Yeah, the, the, the NFL is, is they're really, really good about making these deals. And they don't say to, to these guys, okay, you can put it online if you feel like it. They've got those rights locked up. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff about uh, sports is, is huge, and you see a lot of sports moving from broadcast to cable. That said, there is a lot of uh, sports that's on broadcast uh, right now. Um, but, yeah, it's one of the reasons why ESPN is not going to go a la carte. Uh, it will be like probably the last channel to go to a la carte. Um, that said, you, one of the more interesting things that happened prior to the HBO announcement was that ESPN said, we're doing a deal with the NBA where you're going to be able to buy some kind of basketball, uh, some kind of programming from us in a couple years. We're not exactly sure what it is yet, but you'll be able to buy that a la carte without getting ESPN. And, and what they're, they're the line they're walking there, it's sort of the, the variant of the line HBO is putting out, which is this isn't going to cannibalize our business. It's going to be an additive to our business. It's not going to be something that will take away from what's already on ESPN. That said, you've got ESPN who's, you know, 
the king of the bundle, the king of the existing system, saying, we'd like to explore some variants on this business as well, which is, again, that's a very interesting time to watch all this stuff happening, really, in the last few months. And you're talking about actually buying a game itself, like an NBA game per game. Is that what they're going to offer? Again, they haven't. They they haven't said. They I think they floated the notion that there might be a per game transaction. You might buy a package of games. Um, uh, the point is that you know if they're showing Miami versus Cleveland as the opening game on ESPN, you're not going to be able to buy that separately. But there would be some other games you'd be able to buy somehow. Yeah, Alex, I'm curious what you think when it comes to buying things really a la carte down to just on-demand, specific show, specific uh, game. You know, do you think that's something that people, I mean, that's what everyone talks about wanting, but when they actually get a bill for it, they might not like it as much. So I do that already on Amazon, and I, I think it's interesting that we haven't really spoken about that thus far because... Um, you know, as Peter said, you will save money if I'm buying the season pass, The Good Wife, which is the only CBS show that I watch. Um, that does cost me whatever it is, thirty-four dollars a year, right? So, long run, might be cheaper if I like two shows. So, I I'm not quite sure what the reaction is going to be from iTunes and Amazon to this, and how they're going to deal with the pricing of those a la carte shows. Because right now, if I can't watch some something on demand and I've missed it and I didn't record it on DVR, I do do the all of Yeah, and I, what does this also mean for, what does this mean for the incumbents like Netflix um, and Hulu? This, you know, Hulu, or Netflix stock got hit pretty hard. I mean, they also came in saying that their subscriber growth wasn't as expected, um, but these two moves also seem to be direct attacks on them. If everyone has a streaming service, what what is where does that leave Netflix? Well, for me, I mean, it's gonna it, it depends on how much more they beef up their original content. I mean, it, those people that are viewing only movies on HBO, I think that Netflix has obviously built their their brand around their their growth around these original shows, and they can't just leave it with the couple of hits they have now. They're gonna have to seriously beef that up to stay in contention. Do you have thoughts on that, David, where this leaves yeah. Netflix? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a double-edged sword for them. I mean, on one hand, to the extent that people do cut the cord, it helps them because they're a core service for cord cutters. I, mean, I, uh, I don't know many people who cut the cord and don't get to Netflix. On the other hand, it raises their marketing costs, probably raises their programming costs, so will get more competition for these shows. So, um, you know, who knows, but uh, you know, look at it two ways. Any other thoughts, Peter, about that? Yeah, I mean, um, so and they've been saying for a long time, like, we want to compete with the HBOs and Showtime's the role. By the way, that's probably one of the things you'll see in the next few months is Showtime making a similar announcement. They're certainly considering it. They've said they're considering it. Um, but, you know, in a world where it's, it, you know, a lot of people get HBO and Showtime, a lot of people get HBO and Netflix, um, you know, the, at a core, it just says to Netflix, as it's said for a while, like, we just got to have a, a service that's good enough to get people to pay eight bucks a month. And Alex was talking about people sort of toggling in and out of these services. You could certainly do that, but the reality is most people, once you give a hand over your credit card and say, bill me eight bucks a month, you don't usually go out of those businesses, which is out of those services, which is why they're so great. That's why the gym business works really well, too. Um, but also note that on the, on the day that Time Warner announced the, the HBO deal, they also announced they were selling Friends to, to Netflix. Um, so Time Warner wants to keep selling stuff. They don't want Netflix to go away because they like the checks that Netflix writes it for its old programming. So, you know, Time Warner envisions a world where people are buying HBO and they're buying Netflix because they're also essentially buying old Time Warner shows. They don't want to see Netflix go away. So I, the reason I mentioned the toggling in and out is because I did that when I still used cable, I would sign up for HBO when Game of Thrones came on and then disconnect it when it came off. Now that it has a roster of shows that I watch, that's something I've stopped doing, but that means that they are they have to keep up that original programming, for me at least, throughout the year. Yep. And one of the things we, we always forget to talk about or we, we eventually get around to is that even when people cut the cord to cable and pay TV packages, they're still getting broadband from a lot of the same companies. I mean, it's you know, it's just ending up a different kind of bundle put together a different kind of way, but it's still kind of going to the same players. I mean, is that what you see, Andrew? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, m most of these folks that you're signing up with, like Verizon, and you know, if you just say, "I just want data," I mean, they're 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 leaning on you really hard to get the video for free. I mean, they said, "Just let us hand you the video stuff. Just just watch this, so we can tell these other folks that we have this many people, you know, subscribing to the video packages." Um, so it is interesting what what Alex talked about. I mean, we're we're basically seeing a case that. We're, we're paying for the same product several times over, whether it's through your cable subscription or through Netflix or through Amazon Prime. Um, and, you know, I, I, I felt a little bit bad for, Nets, for Netflix, but then, as Peter said, if they've got friends, then I feel better. But for a little while there, it was Amazon Prime got the HBO library, which has been a treasure trove for Amazon, you know, because Amazon can build on top of its system of, you know, uh, gigantic sales and, and moving product, this little thing called video streaming, whereas Netflix, that's all they do. So they have to be really scared that Amazon has got a huge, huge, uh, a, a huge hammer to, uh, to, to come down and, and cut deals that can really affect Netflix in the future. Well, not now even, but in the future. For sure. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. It's been a really good discussion. Uh, I want to thank our guests, Alex Leo at Newsweek, Andrew Lee at American University, David Lieberman at Deadline.com, our producer Fanny Cohen, and Peter Kafka at Recode. I want to also thank our sponsor, Next Space and Next Kids. You can learn more about their program at nextspace.us slash nextkids. I want to thank PBS and the Knight Foundation for making this possible. Catch us each and every Friday here at the Media Twits and at MediaShift at MediaShift.org. Thanks, everyone.